I've woken up to some very sad news this morning. And that is that the Bight Hall of Plumtree School is on fire. The Bight Hall was the soul and spirit of that school. Ever since it started up as one of the very first schools in the new colony of Rhodesia. My grandfather was appointed as its headmaster in 1906, and he was there for 30 years, bringing his family up initially in the famed Plumtree Huts. And I'll, I'll post a picture of those later on to show you those. He believed in giving his boys at that school all the skills they would need to be able to make that new colony outstanding. My father then went on, decided not to go into European education, but to go into African education. He also had exactly that same prize, was to try and educate the boys that went through Cholochum, Zingwani, Goromanzi, make them into the men and the leaders the country was going to desperately need because the speed of change was happening so quickly. So, after I got over the initial agony of understanding that Plumtree had gone and of following the, the loss of Lloyd House, one of the boarding houses, a couple of years ago, I started to reflect on what a legacy I was left by those two men. One who chose European education, because well, there was no African education when he first came in, not at government level. The other who went into African education, because it's given me, I guess, probably a much more objective perspective on everything in that country. And an enduring fascination to find out really might have happened? What, what, what if such and such had really been the truth? Because the more I researched it for my books, the more I realised the absolutely appalling vested interest. It doesn't matter which side of the fence you come from. You can take an action and totally and utterly report it from your perspective. And it'll be wrong. It could be damagingly wrong. Or it could be just extraordinarily right. And so perhaps that's what's driven me more than anything, to try and tell our incredibly colourful history, because it is. There are not many countries in the world that have such a colourful recent history as Rhodesia into Zimbabwe. And to tell it with all those little anecdotes mixed up with some what might have happened along the route. So let's get back to it. And I apologise for being a little indulgent this morning, but it's been a little bit hard to get going, as you can imagine. It's also been a bit of a sideways step because I had lots of response to last week's programme and quite a lot of them saying, look, we'd love a little bit more um, idea of just impressions in that time before the Pioneer Column went up, before it really became political. And so, obviously, that's a time when the missionaries went up more than anything. They were the first Europeans in the main, apart from a few adventurers and some natural, naturalist people like that. But there was nothing really happening there of any great consequence. And in programme number two, I mentioned to you about this extraordinary friendship between King Zilikazi, as he drove them, built the Mdelebele um, nation up, from his move in northern Mozambique, right across the northern Transvaal to cross the Limpopo. And in that time, he met Robert Moffat, and the two of them became very close friends. After he'd eventually got back from um, going up to the Makaloro lands himself to try and cross to the Zambezi, and he became inaugurated as king, then Moffat went up to see him a couple of times more. He went up in 1854, and in fact he and King Mzilikazi went in a wagon to try and find David Livingstone, 
who'd gone missing at that stage. And they didn't find him, but they left some food for him and in the hope that that might eventually get to him. He went back again in 1857 and uh, to ask whether or not he could get a bit of land to start the first mission in Matabililan. And eventually, King Mzilikazi granted him some land at Inyati, which was outside, just near his capital. Obviously, the king understood that there were huge benefits, probably not only keeping them within mind's view and sight and keep an eye on those guys, but also because there was so much to learn from them. And he was intrigued by that overwhelming curiosity. Perhaps that's the one thing I've found in doing all of this, the curiosity of black about white and white about black. It's reflected in so many little casual dropped off remarks, writings from people. And that's what I thought I'd share with you today. So a little bit of a sidetrack. We'll get back to the history next week. It all turns a bit political then. So let's just enjoy this while we're about it. Now, in order to get up to Inyati in time for it to open in 1859, three families of missionaries left Kuruman. Uh, that was John Moffat, that Robert Moffat's son and his family, the Sykes family and the Thomas family. I mentioned the Thomas family last week, talking about Lobengula's inauguration. Thomas Morgan Thomas was running Inyati Mission. He was one of only three Europeans invited to attend the inauguration. So those were the three families that went up. But en route, they also meet up with the Helmores and the Price families. Now, they were actually going up to the Makololo lands because the chief up there, Chief Sekeletu, had given them land to start another mission up there. So they parted company once they'd crossed the Limpopo and the Moffat team went off towards Bulawayo and the rest went up towards Makalolo land. Now, one of the first things that happened was the news came down to hear to say that the Helmores had been killed or had died and so had the Prices. When eventually they stumbled across Mr. Price and two Hellmore children who were on the brink of starvation uh, as they'd lost their way and couldn't find their way out, the truth came out. Now, again, you, you find all these different truths. Some people still say, oh, they died of fever because, of course, there was a huge amount of malaria in that particular area. But... There was this other little truth, and to me it just sounds as though it made sense. There were slave traders visiting the chief at that time. They took one look at these moff missionaries and thought, uh-oh, they're not going to like us. So they asked the chief to poison them, having probably poisoned his mind against them. And the chief administered poisoned beef and most of the Helmore family died, except two children. All of Price family died, except Mr. Price. So that was another intriguing little something. I'd always heard about them and heard they died of fever. It may not have been quite the case. That whole wagon train up was really difficult. They had six really heavily loaded wagons and all the teams of oxen that needed to go, 16 per wagon, plus spares, plus a few horses, plus all the food. Amazing. And off they went. Wheels sticking in sand that deep, eight to ten inches deep, trying to pull these wagons out. The oxen all getting muddled up and their yokes all intertwined. Oh, you can just imagine it, can't you? And interestingly, it's often the writings of the women that, provide a little more life to what happens. The men tended to be perhaps a bit more guarded than what they said. This is another little lovely story because I think this is an amazing story. At one stage, the cattle died of a lung disease. Obviously, very few of them left to pull the wagon. So a message was sent through to King Zilikazi saying, help, can we have some more cattle? Moffat was very concerned about spreading this lung disease through to um, Mzilikazi's cattle as well and he mentioned that and King Mzilikazi sent down his regiments to pull these wagons themselves I mean that 
was an incredible gesture, I think. So six great wagons eventually arrived in Gubaruayo, pulled by Zilikazi's regiments. But before they left, to purify our wagons from disease or any power to injure the country, as well as to sanctify us before coming into close contact with the people and, above all, with the king, the native priest, bearing the tale of a GNU, a GNU, a wildebeest, sprinkled us and our wagons. Before we were quite aware of what he was doing, the doctor had covered us all over with dark spots. Anyway, they all survived, and they were purified and able to continue on their journey. But there was the most incredible noise and demonstrations going on. So lots of dancing and singing and jubilation and spear-throwing. Last, lasted most of the way through. Anyway, these regiments pulled those wagons to Wuluayo. And you can imagine the huge amount of fanfare once they arrived there too. But it was still a slow process. Very, very slow process. And even before the men pulled them, and the, mo the cattle don't, you know, oxen don't move fast. And one poor wife who was pregnant and expecting her baby probably at any moment said, oh, when shall we ever get there at this rate? It is deplorably slow work with long pauses. We do literally creep. If Africa is destined to be Christianized and civilized at bullock wagon pace, the end of the world cannot be as near as some believe. That's a gorgeous comment. <laughs> so there we are. And those three missionaries meeting up with the Helmors and the prices going up to Makalolo, they eventually got to Gubaluayo. Now, they hadn't been there very long when Thomas, Morgan Thomas' wife, died. She was only 22. Well, King Zilikazi was devastated. Take the poor motherless ones to the wagon, for I cannot bear the sight. She, who is no more, was lovely and beloved. That great comment. She was only 22 and died having a child. It seemed to happen such a lot. So there we had the poor old Helmors and Prices. They didn't make it up to Makalolo. Those three did. And then gradually they managed to build a life. Always tried to have more than one missionary family there at one time. Didn't always work, but that was the intention. So Thomas Morgan Thomas, as I mentioned in last week's program, was one of only three Europeans invited to attend the inauguration. I don't know if it was the case, but whether his wife was another one, I don't know. But apparently she was horrified by the slaughter of the cattle. And the process was that each of those cattle was dedicated to a former king, a former ancestor. And this would track it back, not unlike the Old Testament, the begats, King Mzilikazi, Father Machobana, back back, back, and a cattle, a cow, dedicated to each one. And they were all killed in an order. So the pure black ones probably went to the most recent, or I'm not sure what that would have been, but the pure black ones were killed first, then the black and white ones, and then the multicoloured ones. And it was a swift killing, just one stab of a spear behind the shoulder. But 60... Dead cattle in the middle of the arena must have been a fairly daunting sight because they would be chopped up very quickly, put into specific huts with the doors left open overnight so that the spirits of those ancestors could be blessed by their own cattle. Fascinating. Love that. <laughs> so at the end of all of that, then King uh, Chief Nkumbata, who had been acting as regent, while all the trouble went on as to sorting out uh, Lovengula, there is the country of my father, his cattle and his people. Take them and be careful of them. Those whom sin punish, those who obey reward. So that was the charge to the new king, King Lovengula. So there, there's some lovely little comments to Thomas Morgan Thomas. 
going back and forth between Mzilikas and Lebengura a little bit, but just going back to just before Mzilikatsi died, and Thomas Morgan Thomas was preaching about honour thy father and my mother. Now, obviously, King Mzilikatsi used to come and hear him from time to time because he shouted out and he said, it's all false. What honour would you give to a woman who would never go to war? So that was an interesting insight. Another little takeaway insight was one of the wives said that they had a, a very angry horse called Bless. And Bless did not like pigs. Whenever a pig came near it, it would clamp on him just behind the head and shake that pig. Though they didn't come too close. One night, unfortunately, Bless decided to do the same to a man who happened to be passing by. Picked him up by the neck and shook him. I think Bless probably passed on at that stage. So those are all these little interesting bits and pieces. Lobengula's inauguration, I mentioned last night, the Holy of Holies was the goat crawl, and that was where everything took place. So what was Lobengula himself like? Again, this was a description by one of the wives. He walks as no other man before, planting feet one after another, as if forever. One of the most intelligent men in the nation. Memory prodigious has great tact and natural politeness, dignified, cool. A pair of boots is size 17, but mostly he wears just socks. An immense appetite, has monkey skins hanging before and behind, and even in his royal nakedness, he is very much a king. So there you are, all you doubters who think that King Lobengula just gave the country away. He was a king. Fascinating. Okay, so there we go. And then he, what were his favourite places? Well, his favourite place was actually living in an ox wagon, which was inside the royal crawl. So he preferred to live in the ox wagon itself. And the other thing that was one of his favourite things was a straight-backed and very substantial green chair with red daubs all over it. This was carried everywhere for him, so that it would be there for him when he arrived. The king was fascinated by everything and everyone. This is another lovely little excerpt there by a, a man called Alex Boggy. His mother, there was a memorial to her in the middle of Bulaway Crossroads, Jeannie Boggy. No, Gwello, I think, perhaps it was. Mine's going. Anyway... Alex writes, I was visiting the king alone with one of the missionaries, his wife, and a young lady relative of theirs. Conversation with the king turned on marriage. He wanted to know how it was so many white men had no wives. Boggy, why don't you get married? I can get no one. No one will have me. The king hesitated, looked at me, then a young lady sitting near me, and we could see his eyes twinkle. I will settle that question. There's a young woman by you. I will give her to you as wife. How I replied to the question, I do not know, for neither of us were prepared to have the marriage ceremony thrust upon us at a moment's notice. All I do know is that our confusion afforded the king great pleasure. So he was obviously a man with great sense of humour as well. So what else was happening at that time? Well, Hope Fountain was formed in 1870. And only a month after Lobengula's inauguration, the land was given again to the London Missionary Society to form Hope Fountain, which was very close to where he was building his new crawl. Now, Thomas Baines, the painter, was one of the few who went there at that time. And he had some interesting reflections. He saw the discipline and war dances of the Matebele, two divisions of the army having just returned from a raid on the Mashonas, in which they had killed more than 200 men, women and children and taken 8,000 head of cattle. The king came to inspect Hope Fountain shortly after that, and on seeing the bricks being made, he insisted on sending a man to learn how to do it himself and then to take that back and build him a house of brick. The royal ladies came with him, and they were looking for presents. Coffee with sugar was a great appeal. 
white jackets, vests, blue striped shirts. The king said his heart would now be empty without his new friends. It's a nice way of putting it. They were also inspected by the rainmakers. The rainmakers came to see who were these lot, what are they doing? They did not like cigarettes. People learnt very soon not to smoke cigarettes. They didn't like the white stripes on the Union Jack. They preferred the red ensign, as long as it didn't flutter. But the worst thing of all was white shirts or trousers should never be spread out to dry because they would chase away the clouds. Dark clothes were okay. Oh, intriguing. Just English were just as interested all as the Africans were in them. And in fact, there's a lovely little note. There was a naturalist by the name of Frank Oates, and he went up to see if he could go up and do a bit of exploring in the country. And the king was lying almost naked on a skin inside his royal hut. To enter, Oates crawled in on his knees, as everybody did. When the interview was over and it was time to leave, he tried to crawl out backwards, but the king noticed that he was having rather a difficult time, so he called him back in and allowed him to crawl out face first. <laughs> I love these little anecdotes. But all the time, of course, the impi was sitting there saying, we want to wash our spears on these white people. Lot of mistrust. Understandably, a lot of mistrust from the whites in the Matabilis. Understandably. It was tense, it was difficult, it was two lots of difficult people. Different cultures, clash of culture, my goodness, of course. But still within it all, I found the overwhelming feeling was curiosity about each other and great acceptance once they really got to know each other. There was a family called Bowen Reese. Now, this is bringing us up to 1893 when the Matabili War was just about starting and Lobengula realised things were going to get very, very difficult. Bowen Rees was then looking after Inyati and he sent him a message addressing it to my missionary, telling them to leave Inyati at once because they might, he might not be able to protect them and he sent them with a bodyguard as far as Tati undoubtedly saved their lives. So, we have a complex, intelligent leader in King Lobengula and a handful of missionaries who were determined to try and bring them a new way of doing things. Not killing, not raiding, etc. Very hard when that was what had been done for hundreds and hundreds of years. It was the way of life. And poor King Lobengula as things drew towards that terrible time of 1893, negotiating with the Pioneer Column, negotiating with Rudd, he said, The chameleon gets behind the fly, remains motionless for some time, then advances slowly and gently, first putting forward one leg and then another. At last, when he's in reach, he darts his tongue and the fly disappears. England is the chameleon. I am the fly. Tough. Nothing like this is ever easy, is it? OK, so next week we get back to the politics. We get back to all the countries pressing in on King Lovingula. It wasn't just England, it was everywhere else. All trying to get his attention and a slice of the pie. How did it work? Why did he favour the British? How was it done? Look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you for joining me.